praises of God here in the church. Now, uh, if you listen carefully to this morning's epistle reading, you know that we read from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And you know that it took two letters from St. Paul to even begin to straighten out my crazy ancestor, the Corinthians. In fact, some scholars even think it took a third letter that never survived. But at any rate, we read from his letter today. And what St. Paul says in this morning's reading is actually absolutely stunning. That if we take what he says here seriously, it would change our perception of ourselves and everyone around us. We, we, us, are the temple of the living God, St. Paul says. It's amazing. The church is not the building. The church is you. The building we have for convenience. And on the inside of your mind and heart, you see how everything here is focused on Jesus? Inside your mind and heart, everything inside you is supposed to be focused on Jesus as well. That's why we have all of the iconography that we have. Never to let you get away from Jesus. So we Christians, followers of Jesus, all of us sitting here this morning, who've been received, into, received, I'm sorry, been baptized into Christ, received the Holy Spirit, collectively and individually, we are the temple of God. So Hannah, that means you're a temple of God, baby. Whoa, that's pretty good. Wow, Adam, even you are a temple of God. Okay, <laughs> that's news to me, but I love it. I love it. So, a temple is a sacred space. Have you ever thought of yourselves as being sacred? As being a space in which the living God can make his home? That having been baptized into Christ and conforming our lives to Christ, we've received the Holy Spirit, and God has come to dwell in us if we allow him to, if we open our hearts and minds to him. He's already there. In the book of Revelation it says, God's knocking on the door of our hearts. He's already there, especially if you've been baptized and chrismated. But we still have to open the door. He will not kick down the door, but he will come in if we allow him to, if we open the door. Now, God has chosen to reveal himself to us by living in us. So God is not just out there, wherever out there, whatever that means for you. God is also in here. God is in our hearts. He's in our minds. That's why the spiritual life has often been called the interior life. So God is our king, St. Nicholas Cavasilis once wrote. Actually, almost a thousand years ago. God is our king. And he is more a part of us than our own limbs and more necessary to us than our own heart. Now, if we truly thought of ourselves as temples of the living God, that he's made his home in us, as St. Paul writes, how would that change us? I want to read to you a couple of examples, if I can, just briefly, about how early Christians lived because they were very clear that Christ had come to dwell in them. So this is from a writer in the second century. His name is Aristides. He wrote a letter to the emperor because Christians were being persecuted. And eventually he also dies as a martyr, executed for his faith. He says, Emperor, it's the Christians who have sought and found the truth. They acknowledge God. They believe in him, the creator and builder of the universe in whom all things are and from whom everything comes. They worship no other God and they have his commandments written on their hearts. They observe these commandments because they live in the hope and expectation of the coming age of the world. They do not commit adultery. They do not live in fornication. They do not lie. They don't keep for themselves the goods that have been entrusted to them. They are not greedy, and they don't covet what belongs to others. They honor their father and their mother, 
They show love to their neighbors. They do not do to anyone else what they would not wish done to themselves. They speak gently to those who oppress them, and in this way, they make them their friends. It has become their passion to do good even to their enemies. Any male or female slaves or dependents whom individuals among them may have, slavery was still big in the ancient world, but not based on race as it is here in America, they persuade them to become Christians because of the love they feel towards them. And if they don't become Christians, they are still brothers to them without any discrimination. Christians live in awareness of their smallness. Kindless is their nature. They love one another. They don't neglect widows. Orphans they rescue from those who are cruel to them. Every one of them who has anything gives it ungrudgingly to the one who has nothing. Because they don't call each other brothers according to the flesh. They know they are brothers in the Spirit of God. If one of them sees that one of the poor must leave this world, he provides for his burial as best as he can. If anyone among the poor comes into want while they themselves have nothing to spare, they actually fast two or three days in order to provide food for him. They're ready to give up their lives for Christ. And if any one of them who is righteous dies and passes from this world, they rejoice and give thanks to God. They escort his body as though he were simply moving from one place to the next. Because of them, the Christians, good flows on in the world. And yet, they don't announce to the ears of the masses the good deeds they do. Rather, they take care that no one should notice them. They hide their giving like someone who conceals a treasure that he's found. They strive for righteousness because they live in the expectation of seeing Christ in his radiance and receiving from him the fulfillment of all the promises that he made. Here's one more. This is from a letter written by a Christian to a man whose name was Diognetus, who was not a Christian at all, just a friend, but a pagan friend. He says, you know, Christians can't be distinguished from the rest of mankind by country, speech, or customs. They live in their own countries, but only as guests and aliens. They take part in everything as citizens, but they endure everything as aliens. Every foreign country is their homeland, and every homeland is like a foreign country to them. They marry like everyone else. They have children, but they never expose their children after they're born. What does that mean? It means that in the ancient Mormon world, if a child was born, a father had complete authority over whether or not that child would live. And so if the father did not want that child, he could say to the midwives, take them out, put them outside the city walls, just leave them there. Now you have to understand, Christians didn't do that. They didn't kill their own children. But not only that, he doesn't mention this here, but not only that, Christians would go out to those places where these kids were dumped and just left for animals to eat, to die of exposure. They would go out, they would adopt them as their own, take them into their own home as their own children and raise them as their own. Hmm. I won't read it all, but I will say one last thing. He says here that just as the soul is enclosed by the body, in the same way, Christians are the soul of the world. You're not only a temple of the living God, you're the soul of the whole world. That's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Now, St. Paul says in his letter, he says, come out from them. 
Come out from them and be separate. So you need to understand that Christians live in the world, but not of the world. There's a big difference. The values of those second century Christians were very different than the Roman society that they lived in. Our values as Christians is different from the society that we live in. In fact, the Christian's values should always be different from any society that we live in. Because as St. Paul writes, we're temples of the living God. Because we are the sons and daughters of the living God. Because God is our Father. And because, as St. Paul writes, we're called to holiness. We have to purify ourselves, St. Paul says. And the word that he uses is katharisome. It's the word we get the modern English word catharsis from. To go through a catharsis, a real cleansing, a purification, can be difficult and even painful. But that's what we're called to. Metals like gold, the scriptures say, they have to be melted down in order to remove impurities. Our God is consuming fire, it says in the letter to the Hebrews. So we have to stand in the midst of God's consuming fire and allow him to consume our impurities, to refine us, to make us what he's called us to be, holy. We're called to be holy. That's what St. Paul says in the scripture reading today. We're called to holiness, he says. Now, that verse of the scriptures, you know where it says, Let us cleanse our souls and our bodies from every defilement of flesh and spirit. That's in today's scripture reading. But that's also one of the prayers, a verse in one of the prayers on page 15 in your liturgy book. You know, because I've told you many, many times that the liturgy is just a bunch of Bible quotes all strung together. And so for us, when we hear this reading today, it's important for us to know that we've already prayed that in the liturgy. Exactly what St. Paul is saying in the scriptures. Now, not this coming week, but the week following, we're supposed to host somebody here, but during the week, I'm supposed to host a meeting of the clergy in the area. And a metropolitan, whose name is Miron, is going to be coming here from New Zealand. And he has a number of islands that are missions for him, uh, where Christ's name has hardly been proclaimed ever. And so he was recently at Holy Cross, and so I watched a little of that presentation because I want to see who the man is before I host him for lunch, right? The purpose of the church, he said, is to lead people to holiness. It's not even just to make us good. It's more than that. It's to produce saints. All the programs and ministries of the church should lead our people to the central goal of life, the main goal of our life, which is to become holy. Now, you know that holiness, holiness is something that we're called to. And in fact, I'm sure you know, because again, I've discussed it many times here, that you are actually addressed as saints in the liturgy. Now, of course, I do that in Greek, Adam, just so you won't understand it, okay? Just because I'm comfortable with that, forgive me. It's something that I can't get out of my mind. So Deacon Dan says, Brosko men, pay attention, listen up. And then I say, Taia tisaiis. So, the holy things, that which is holy, the bread that we're breaking, which will be the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that bread is to be given to the saints. Ta'ayya tis ayis. Tis ayis means literally to the saints. So, it's very literal when we talk about the fact that you are called to be saints. It says it every week in the liturgy. In fact, not only every Sunday in the liturgy, but at every liturgy we do, even during the week. 
You know, one time I did say that, and this poor lady, I don't know, I think she was sitting where you were sitting, Andrew, where you're sitting now. She, she had not heard that in English before. So she didn't apply it to herself, that you actually have to be a saint. She said, I never heard that before, Father. I said, well, it's time you did. And she was from Greece. So I had assumed, maybe too much, Adam, that she had actually known what I was saying. At any rate, she moved to Texas, I think just to get away from me. <laughs> so, <coughs> Mother Teresa was once asked about holiness. And she said that holiness is something for everybody. She said, it's not just for me, it's not just about me. It's for everybody. It's for every Christian who really believes in Jesus Christ and who wants Jesus above all other things. Such a person, in order to be close to Jesus, desires to be holy because that's what being close to Jesus does to us. He makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy. That's impossible. Jesus makes us holy. Everything is grace, pure and simple. Everything is grace. But all of the ascetic life is about opening ourselves to the grace that's always there, always around us, always inviting us, always hoping that we will accept that grace. So, in today's little epistle reading is contained most of the Old Testament and much of the New and its implications for all of us. If I have to be called a saint, so do you. People think sometimes that the priest is the professional Christian. Marianne, that's baloney. <laughs> If you're here on a Sunday morning, you're in it with me, baby, all the way. So you better start singing like Eve asked you to. They sing, they sing. Zoe, you got that? You're going to start singing, baby? Oh, you're singing now. Everybody sing. Oh, this whole group over there, they're okay? They're singing? Okay. Okay. We'll have to put some choir members over there then and check on how you guys are doing. Okay? You're singing, okay. Anyway. God bless you all.